I want to welcome you on behalf of the Center for Labor Studies to this year's seminar, Weaknesses of the Left. Um, as uh, always, first thanks to our, uh, to our supporters and uh, financial supporters and organization supporters, Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung, but also here the collective block and uh, for um, allowing us to have this seminar in their premises here at the BASA. Um, as most of you will have uh, read from, uh, from, I guess, from uh, uh, the, uh, the, the introductory text to, to this um, a seminar, what we are trying to deal with this year is uh, something that we are, uh, uh, most of us, very familiar in our uh, activist uh, everyday practice, that is the weaknesses of the left, but uh, uh, this is something that is, um, at least in our context, still to a large extent left uh, under theorized within the scene. Um, and we'll, our uh, idea was well to provide um, a platform for discussion um, this year on various subject matters which are related to the specificities of the position of the left, not only in the region, but also uh, uh, broader in Europe, but also beyond. Um, our first lecturer is Panagiotis Sotiris, uh, and those of uh, you who have uh, followed our, um, our past work know that he has already been to Zagreb, uh, and uh, he had a lecture uh, on an earlier seminar of ours, which was, I believe, Predicaments of the Left, uh, but then the, uh, I, uh, I believe the full title was um, included Perspectives and Strategies, so we have uh, the, to some extent down-tuned our ambitions. Now it's only a reflection on the weaknesses. But when I got, uh, I believe it was 2013 or 14, 2013, so five years ago already. Um, so this is also, well, an opportunity to, to uh, reflect on, on everything that has happened in the past five years, which for the left has not necessarily been all that positive. Um, Panagiotis uh, Sotiris uh, works as a journalist and editor uh, in Athens, he, where he lives. He's also a member of the editorial board of the Historical Materialism Journal, which most of us are familiar with. Uh, and uh, he also teaches at the Hellenic Open University. Um, he has written numerous uh, articles um, and recently co edited a collective volume entitled Crisis, Movement, Strategy, the Greece uh, Experience published in the Historical Materialism book series. Uh, he will be talking about uh, left, po uh, left populism, that is, its possibilities or impossibilities. Uh, and uh, from um, um, the abstract, uh, you uh, will already have gathered that one of the main focal points, theoretically, uh, of his critique will be uh, Ernesto Laclau. So this, that was my introduction. Now, Bernadette, please. OK, thanks. First of all, I would like to thank the Center for Labor Studies for this uh, very honoring invitation. Uh, I had the best memory from uh, the 2013 uh, conference, although that was, let's say, a period of hope and a period of aspiration, whereas now it is a period of, well, defeat and uh, critical uh, reflection, one might say, although at the same time, there are also new uh, elements of hope uh, uh, in the horizon. I mean, our thoughts today are all, I suppose, in France and what's going to happen in Paris and the other major cities of, uh, of France as the yellow vests, uh, this very contradictory but very inspiring insurrection seems to continue. So, well, it's, on, it's not only about defeat, so it's about also looking to the future. Now, I, I have a presentation that is, it's, it's basically based on, two, on three, three parts. One is a presentation and critique of Ernesto Laclau's theory of, of populism. The second part is um, an overview, partial, of course, of recent attempts to think of left-wing politics as a form of left populism. And the third, and more tentative, more experimental, is an attempt to rethink the notion of the people, not through uh, a, a variety of populism, but through a return to Antonio Gramsci, 
and the notion of the subaltern in Gramsci. So these are, these are the three parts of my uh, presentation. Now, uh, we're all, now Ernesto Laclau's work has made an impressive comeback in the past uh, years. Uh, exactly because of the debates around left populism. His own political experience began, and theoretical experience began in a populist, uh, in a certain way, environment, as he was uh, a very active and a very particular member, a very particular current of the Argentinian left, the Izquierda Nacional, the national uh, left. And already in the 1970s, we have in his first, first book in English, after his uh, move to England, uh, his first book is Politics and Ideology in, Marx, in Marxist Theory, and we have a very important text there, which is uh, Towards a Theory of Populism. It's interesting that already in the 1970s, uh, Laclau insisted on, on, on what he defined as a rejection of re reductionism defined as the absence of any uh, necessary relationship between classes determined by the position within social relations of production and their political ideological practices. Now, at that period, he still insisted on, on some kind of determination of political and ideological forms by social relations, uh, albeit in the last instance, and always insisted that there is no necessary relationship between class position and ideological and ideological position. So it's not like Althusser and Poulanges, where we have the notion of relative autonomy. Here we have already in the 1970s, in Laclau, a stronger form of autonomization. Class relationships relations affected the form, but not necessarily the content of ideology and political practice. Consequently, the terrain of ideology is not about expressions of class positions or about antagonistic sets of ideological forms representing antagonistic class worldviews. Rather, it is about shared signifiers that become the object of antagonistic significations. Uh, consequently, and I quote from Laclau, Classes exist at the, at the ideological and political level in a process of articulation and not of reduction. And so this non-class character of the ideological raw material becomes the necessary starting point for any theory of uh, ideology for Laclau's. And it is only on the condition of such common and shared ideological raw material that we can have strategies of ideological hegemony. And a class can become hegemonic only on the condition that it can absorb and accordingly neutralize to its interest these shared ideological representations. One can refer here to notions of like people, like people, freedom, justice, all these common signifiers. And moreover, Laclau in, in this text of 1977, 1977 insists on the people power block dichotomy as the general form of political antagonism. He still maintains in the 1970s uh, some kind of causal priority of class struggle uh, in regard to political antagonism, but always he stresses the difference between class struggle and uh, political uh, antagonism. So this is, the, one might say, the first move of Laclau from uh, Marx's own insistence on the dialectical relationship between class struggle and political uh, antagonism. And consequently, already in the 1970s, we see the people ceasing to be a synonym for a condition of being subaltern dependent upon class positions, but becoming kind of an empty signifier constantly signified within the terrain of political uh, antagonism. Uh, and this is also based on a certain distinction between class as related to exploitation, uh, but also the people power block dichotomy as based on uh, oppression. And oppression is not determined by exploitation in a certain way. For Laclau, it is related to uh, the state. Uh, so it is like you have the power block and the state on the one hand, the people on the other hand, but where class struggle actually determines remains rather, uh, rather vague. And it's exactly that uh, here that Laclau suggests that populism is exactly the expression of this power versus the power block uh, cleavage and dichotomy. <laughs> 
It's not a variety of political di di discourse. It's not a deformation of democratic politics. And it's not a particular political movement. For Laclau, populism is a discursive and ideological modality which emerges as a, exactly a, because of this particular articulation of political antagonism. So populism emerges for Laclau whenever there is an we have this kind of opposition of, of, of a kind of popular democratic interpolation against the power bloc. So, and this uh, for Laclau also, apart from being uh, uh, analytic, is also prescriptive. Uh, working class cannot be hegemonic unless it has some kind of a populist interpolation. So working class hegemony requires some sort of socialist populism. And populism is the sign par excellence of a hegemonic uh, project. Uh, that's why the famous phrase of Laclau in socialism therefore coincide the highest form of populism and the resolution of the ultimate and most radical uh, of class uh, conflicts. Now, this will be beyond the presentation. There is an interesting debate, unfortunately not too much of it in English yet, in the uh, Latin American left after the defeat, the final defeat of Peronism and the passage from Peronism to dictatorship in the 1970s, uh, re exactly regarding if populism is the answer, and anyone familiar with Spanish, I would suggest to search as much as possible this debate. There were very important critiques of uh, Laclau at that time within the Latin American milieu, for example, from Juan Carlos Portantiero and others. And that's a subject. Now, as we know, biographically then, uh, in England, uh, Laclau starts in the 1980s. We have, through his collaboration with Chantal Mouffe, Hegemony and Socialist Strategy, the, the book that actually made Laclau really an important uh, thinker in the English speaking, but also the international world. Now, now, apart from the Latin American references, here there are also other references. The debates in Eurocommunist and post-Eurocommunist European left the debates in the British left regarding fascism, uh, regarding, sorry, Thatcherism as a uh, hegemonic project in the early, 19, uh, early 1980s, questions of new uh, social movements, and also Laclau uh, studies and, and, and discusses what we can say the post-foundationalist turn in social theory, uh, in, 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 uh, and all this uh, emph new emphasis on radical contingency, the incompleteness of the social and consequently of any uh, possible social theory. Uh, so this can explain the difference in, uh, let's say, the, the discourse and the vocabulary between his book of the 1970s, which still is a very classical Marxist book in, in terms of vocabulary, and hegemony and socialist strategy. But I do think, uh, that we also we also find here elements of uh, of of continue or one might say a radicalization of the initial uh, positions. Uh, there is all this debate around what actually this course means in Laclau in and Laclau and Move in in the 1980s. They have always insisted that this course. It's not about uh, language or particular language practices, it's about a more general relational conception of society, a conception of a relational totality, which is also an incomplete uh, uh, totality. But I also think that this theoretical and semantical shift also in makes even stronger the delinking between uh, populist discourse or and uh, class positions that we already uh, can find in the text from the 1970s. And this is now turned from the question of populism to the question of hegemony. Hegemony is delinked, in my opinion, uh, from class projects and strategies and presented as a more general modality uh, of, uh, of populism. And I think that uh, this opens the way for the second theorization of populism uh, by Laclau that we can find uh, in, in Populist Reason, his 2005 uh, book. Because, as I said, Laclau's initial theorization remained to a certain extent within the contours of a classical distinction between form and content. 
Politics is rooted in social relations of production, albeit in the last instance, and the only form that political and ideological interrelations can take is that of the people power block uh, divide. Uh, but I think that here we have a, a bigger delinking uh, with class practices and class determinations regarding uh, the formulation of hegemony within uh, Laclau's theoretical project. I think that one might say that he has a much more generalized uh, conception of antagonism, which makes no distinction or hierarchy between class antagonism and political uh, antagonism. And uh, so in the end, it ends up into a discourse-centered uh, approach. And even he makes all this attempt to distinguish his conception of discourse for, let's say, a simple language, linguistic or language turn. In the end, since politics also is about enunciations, when we do politics, we address, we speak. So it ends up as a discourse-centered approach in the narrow sense of, of discourse. Now, in populist uh, reasons, this takes a, is most, uh, uh, most evident. And it is also interesting how the notion of the people becomes, for Laclau, the moment of crystallization of a chain of semantic equivalence that bring together different demands and aspirations into a new emerging popular subjectivity. And this crystallization has less to do with the actual demands or historical and socioeconomic processes that generate them. The crucial point is the political and semantic operation that creates the chain of equivalence that bring together these demands. I think this is a very important point that marks this uh, this distancing. It, it's just that you have a series of demands. You don't, there's no priority, either relational or, or ontological, to what demands are more important, what kind of uh, cleavages or antagonists are more important. The crucial point is a semantic operation. If you can sort of find something that acts as the common signifier uh, for all different demands and create these chains of equivalence. And he, it's interesting to see uh, that he, which in the end, you create a common cause, a unitary enemy and target, and uh, a singular element. And for example, using the example of Russian society in 1917, which is an interesting choice, we all remember that also Louis Althusser used Russia inside the 17 in uh, contradiction over determination to uh, think about over determination. Uh, he insists that it was exactly the emptiness of the terms of the terms used by the Bolsheviks to express demands that enabled that kind uh, of universality that transcended their actual uh, particular demands. And I think it is here that we find the displacement from a logic of over determination. That is, that uh, political antagonism is always overdetermined. It's not like in a simple unitary way class struggle emerges. Class struggle can be articulated and overdetermined by political antagonism, by national antagonism, by the relationship between the national and the international and the crisis of imperialism. But it, this, this is the, this, at least in, in Althusser, was thought of in terms of overdetermination, whereas in Laclau it's a process of signification. It is a somehow uh, all this acquire a common meaning without thinking more about how is this common meaning uh, presented. This, so the, the, the moment of politics becomes a moment of uh, significa signification. But for example, let's take the very example, let's take the Russian Revolution. So the question of war, along with the demands for land and wealth redistribution, they represented not only some partial, partial and non-connected demands emerging at different points of Russian society that required a semantic discursive shift to, uh, to acquire the role of a universal representation of what the subaltern classes in Russia uh, wanted, actually, war, the imperialist war and Ru the Russian, Russia's participation. It was the condensation of antagonisms and contradictions running through Russian society. Thus, war became by itself, as a material pro process, the nodal point of the conjecture in the sense that the, the un 
antagonistic political strategies around this question would also determine its, uh, its outcome. So politically targeting the question of war and combining it with the basic demands of peace and land were not just simple political interventions or discursive enunciations that would make these partial elements representative of universality. Actually, they were a material attempt to intervene in a complex set of overdetermined causal, causal relations. And so the centrality of war was not a discursive construction. The centrality of war in the Russian conjecture was, first of all, an actual material condensation of contradictions at all, social, at all levels of social formation. It was actually in a very real way, before it, even before it became part of a political enunciation. It would have been a strategic nodal point whether someone <laughs> would enunciate it, create a discourse on it, or, or not. Uh, and I think this example can help us understand the limits of this uh, thinking of Laclau only in terms of semantic shifts. It's also interesting to see, he uses two examples of successful, uh, he uses some examples of successful progressive popular mo populist movements and reactionary right-wing populist movement. So it's interesting that in the book he, he talks about, on the one hand, Partito Nuovo, which uh, Palmiro Togliatti's conception of the, of the Italian Communist Party as a party that could create a people, and also Lega Nord. Now, the problem is that the, the, the experience of the Italian Communist Party does not fall, for my opinion, within uh, Laclau's description of construction of the people because the, 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 the Italian Communist Party was not simply the result of an interpolation. It had deep and historical roots in the working class, both the industrial working class of the North and the proletarian strata of the South. It gained access to peasant strata. It represented intellectuals and civil servants. It had an impressive network of social organizations and movements that could consequently expressed in a common perspective antagonisms that were already interlinked and correlated in the very reality of the uneven and contradictory development of Italian capitalism. So it was not, it was the creation of a social alliance or, a, or, a, or, a polit or the political representation of a social alliance based upon practices and not just a discursive uh, construction. In contrast, it's interesting that if you see the emergence of Lega Nord, uh, Laclau discusses Lega Nord of the 1990s, the first wave and early, early uh, 2000s, uh, but now it's even <laughs> more pertinent. It's interesting that there, in that form of a right-wing populism, you can find this process of uh, semantic signification. And if you follow the emergence of such right-wing populist movements, and we have ex examples both in Western Europe and Eastern Europe, you can see this process. Yes, there you have societies where former networks and former collective practices have been disaggregated and disintegrated in a certain way. You have various grievances and you have, uh, you know, right-wing populist leaders or far-right-wing populist leaders actually using empty signifiers as uh, ways to uh, create this chain of equivalence in the sense well, your problem is that. It works with right-wing populism. It hasn't worked with left movements. That's, that's my opinion. I mean, for example, yes, it, it's more easy to, dem to, to find an empty signifier, like let's say George Soros in the case of Viktor Orban's Hungary, and say he's, he's the demon for so, and sort of create semantic equivalences, or migrants, uh, for example, uh, I, I, and say uh, this is the problem is immigration in countries that have some hundreds of only refugees actually arrive them. So this is semantic. The emergence of radical left populist, popular movements is not semantic process. So this is something. Now, moving to the second part of my presentation, well, there is, a, but, uh, there is an important debate currently around uh, left uh, populism coming from various, uh, various instances. Uh, well, first of all, it's interesting. There is even, I mean, Santal Mouffe, 
Ernesto Laclau's main collaborator, has recently published uh, a call for a left populism, uh, which he describes as a discursive strategy of construction of the political frontier between the people and the oligarchy, which for her constitutes in the present conjuncture the type of politics needed to recover and deepen uh, democracy. Uh, so, uh, for a it's interesting that for MOVE, Basically, it's the only way to bring together uh, different uh, social strata and create the kind, because it's exactly, he calls it a populist moment. There is a disintegration of the historical bloc uh, of the uh, European bourgeoisie or global capital, if you, if you prefer. And now this, this for her, enables the possibility to construct a new subject of collective uh, collective uh, action. So it's interesting that she also thinks that a left populism is able to win back voters from right-wing uh, populism, uh, describing it as a form of radical reformism, uh, somewhere in the middle between classical social democratic type of politics and a more Leninist or insurrectionary mode of, of politics. So now, uh, there is also, and I won't get into many details so that I can get to the, so that I don't take up too much of your time. There's an inter there is an entire also literature emerging on whether we can describe parties uh, like Syriza or Podemos as uh, populist movements, left <coughs> populist movements. I would suggest in particular the work, which is really interesting, done by uh, Yanis Stavrakakis uh, at the Populismus. It's a research module in the University of uh, Thessaloniki in the north of Greece. And they have, and he and, uh, and some of his collaborators, like Yoruk Katsabekis and Alexander Skupkulis, have, have presented really interesting approaches using Laclau's framework. Stavrakakis was a student of Laclau in England before coming to Greece. So, and, and they insist that uh, in a way the, 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 the operation, the trajectory of Syriza from a minority leftism to political power, uh, it was the movement, it was the move from a minoritarian populism towards uh, a new, creating exactly new equivalential change in the period of social and political crisis and creating a version of the people that was portrayed as a plural and heterogeneous collective uh, subject against uh, an, the establishment. This is basically their, uh, the way they theorize Syriza and its creation, discursive creation of a notion of the, uh, of the people. Uh, there are surely very interesting points there. Uh, it's important to remember that Syriza by itself was a very classical left party in, in terms of reformists, but classical left. It, was never cons it never had a, a theoretical reference to, to populism uh, or anything like that. Now, it's also interesting also to see the discussions around Podemos. Uh, in Podemos, uh, we have also another interesting point. Podemos was not only, it can be classified according to Laclau or Stavrakakis and his collaborators as a left populist party. But uh, in Podemos, we also have a very strong current that actually self-defines as, 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 uh, uh, as, uh, as populist. Uh, and as uh, Josep Maria Antentas has noted, one of the souls of Podemos leadership is what could be called a deep populist current led by the party's number two, Inijo Erejon. This is the sector that has most fiercely advocated a project that detaches itself symbolically and discursively for any kind of tradition of the left. It is based on a conception of politics as an autonomous field that is discursively constructed through meanings that are being produced and uh, disputed. It's also interesting that, uh, especially Erejon, if you look at, for example, both his various interventions, but also uh, his PhD, which was an attempt to 
present the emergence of MAS and Evo Morales in, in Bolivia as a case of, uh, of populism. It's interesting because Erejón has done field work in Bolivia and he always insists in his PhD that it is about discursive elements, constructions, ways of appealing. Uh, in my opinion, uh, underestimating the very fact that if you look at the history of uh, Evo Morales' ascent to power and also the creation of MAS and, and how it, it was, it had much more to do with very real struggles, less than creating a common identity, uh, the entire and other struggles of, uh, that actually create this kind of dynamic. Uh, but it's interesting uh, to see this element of Podemos, which was also, I have to say, uh, very linked to their electoralism. It's also important to remember that Podemos was from the beginning an, a, a party centering of, uh, on elections, electoralist in, in, a, in a kind of a belief in, in electoral. They wanted to be an electoral machine. They had this idea that the only way to get all this indignation into a political movement was exactly to offer a, a, a way to represent it electorally. And how do you create something that represents, you create a kind of electoral representation, you appeal, you, you create a discourse, a discourse that's neither left nor right. It's based on dichotomies like the people versus uh, La Casta, as they called the, the entire old political establishment and that. So this, uh, this is uh, interesting. Now, uh, of course, the, the problem, of course, regarding uh, populism is not the description. I mean, it's obvious that when we talk about this, uh, all these political, current political phenomena, the notion of the people has returned. We, we've seen that in action. We've seen that in, in Occupy. We've seen it in Greece. We've seen it in Spain. We are seeing it in a certain way in, uh, in France, and, and as Félix Bourgeot has suggested, uh, the yellow vests are the empty signifier par excellence, a, a common element that anyone can, uh, can attach to. But the problem when we're doing about, both about theory and about politics is not just to describe that people look for a common, I mean, people in struggle look for common identities or common, or common meaning, is how they are produced and how do you politically inter, intervene in them. In this sense, it's interesting also that uh, there have been more, also more critical uh, approaches uh, to such elements. Uh, there have been rejections of the notion of, uh, of populism. For example, Marco Revelli uh, still insists on a very classical critique of uh, populism as a symptom of a problematic functioning of democratic institutions, insisting that parties like Syriza are, are more popular than, uh, than populist. Uh, it's interesting also to see uh, how Etienne Balibar has confronted in past years the question of populism because he has suggested on the one hand that a kind of a post-national European uh, populism uh, as a way to rethink the becoming political of the people is uh, a kind of necessity in the current uh, conjuncture. Uh, but at the same time, uh, he insists that uh, it's very difficult for theorists of populism to explain why, uh, why also, uh, the, in a certain cases, the, the, the contradictions of such, such movements. Uh, for example, you can, for example, he stresses how you might uh, have uh, very big movements that at the same time create a need, sorry, uh, demand very uh, demands of social justice, and at the same time you you can see them mixed with national elements or even nationalist elements. So how do you theorize such such uh, contradictions? 
Uh, so that's why, for example, Balibar has insisted uh, on the need uh, for a kind of a post-national uh, or transnational conception of citizenship as a counterweight to the constant re-emergence of nationalism in, and racism in contemporary, uh, contemporary politics. Uh, so uh, it's not just about simply calling uh, for a democratic, uh, new democratic populism for Balibar. Uh, one might also, and, uh, Michael Bray has also f offered a very more uh, complex theorization of this question of, of populism. Uh, which, uh, in a certain way for him, uh, populism is a kind of a symptom a symptom of expression of contemporary class struggles, but also it points to the way also of new forms to uh, politically construct class. That is, the emergence of populist elements, populist discourses, the appeal of populists, uh, populist uh, interpolation also comes uh, in a period of crisis that affects not only the regime of capitalist accumulation, but how class identities are defined and reproduced. So uh, this, uh, this can offer the, uh, the potential to rethink uh, populism as a challenge. Uh, in a similar way, I would suggest the work being done by Carlo Formenti uh, in Italy. Uh, he has a a very different approach. Formenti is very critical of it's not following something like, like Laclau or Mouffe. He begins by uh, analyzing contemporary forms of capitalist exploitation and the anti-democratic turn of neoliberal capitalism. And he also he's also very critical of the technological optimism one can find in the workerist and post-workerist traditions that are very current still in, in Italy. So uh, so, for Formenti, if, so, for example, something like what Negri would say, for Negri, it's always this technological optimism. There's always something positive in the new forms of uh, working class uh, formation uh, in, uh, in contemporary capitalism. For Formenti, is uh, a process of... Uh, uh, increased exploitation, authoritarianism, and also uh, dismantling of previous class identities. In such a case, uh, for Fermenti, the challenge is if you have increased exploitation with erosion of democracy and erosion of popular sovereignty, if we can rethink in a certain way the challenge of populism, as a way of, of a recuperation of, uh, of popular sovereignty uh, and a conception of the people as the only way politically to bring together uh, all this exploited strata uh, in, a thing, in a conjuncture where we have more, uh, let's say, disaggregated and disarticulated class identities. So this, this, so, so in this sense, there is a, an interesting debate, I think, going on, and one, there are things to be learned from it. Now, moving to the third and final part of my, of my presentation. So it's, it's obvious that left populism poses a challenge. The limits of crude class reductionism uh, are obvious. I mean, it's very difficult to see political forms as direct as direct reflections of class practices. The crisis of traditional workers' organizations, the shifts of political allegiance of industrial workers in many instances in the past decades, the appeal of racism or the populist right in working class uh, strata attest uh, to this. And the same goes for the limited appeal of traditional class forms of interpolation. Moreover, in recent movements, we've seen this need for common identities, especially around the notion of the people. So is this, uh, so that, that, that this, this means that we should go towards a form of left populism. This is, the, this is the challenge. I would suggest that we try to rethink the notions 
of the popular uh, and uh, and the people uh, through through Gramsci, and in particular the concept of the subaltern. The concept of the subaltern usually has been used in uh, the context, context of the subaltern post-colonial field of research as synonymous with uh, uh, exclusion, exclusion, mainly. But I think that it is possible to rethink, uh, and I follow here also Peter Thomas' recent reading of it in an important intervention, uh, that it is more a more strategic concept, representing Gramsci's attempt to rethink the dialectic of social and political forms of exploitation and oppression on the one hand, but also recognition and resistances. And I think that subalternity in this sense bridges the gap between the social condition and the political practice of the subaltern since it is constituted and reconstituted constantly within the political forms of modernity, and, but at the same time grounded in the, in the social relations of, uh, of, uh, of production. I mean, uh, because if we try and see the, the, the very emergence of the political forms of, of modernity, uh, they include both a moment of recognition of the subaltern and, and a constant attempt to disaggregate it uh, and even oppress it. And, then, and the very history of the notion of the people, in a certain way, can offer such, such, uh, such a, a perspective. I mean, the notion of the people emerges in, the cons as we, in, in its contemporary form. It emerges in the context of the French Revolution in the Jacobin phase as a very uh, agonistic kind of uh, form. Uh, and also even the, the, the modern political form and the nation state includes this moment of recognition. The, the subaltern are included in the imagined community of the nation. And at the same time, the very history of modernity, and, or capitalist modernity, if you prefer, is all the attempts to disaggregate, to make sure that they never gain, uh, the subaltern never gain historical initiative, either by means of, let's say, try to incorporate them into the dominant narrative, or by oppressing them, or by various disciplinary uh, practices. So, in this sense, one might say that uh, this means that the political vocabulary and the political forms and the political imagery we are associated includes this, this very specific tension. And the tension, for example, what Laclau would call it, uh, uh, the, the people versus the power block dichotomy, is indeed constitutive, but it is constitutive exactly because of the articulation be between the political forms and, and the dominant form of production, the dominant mode of production, that is uh, capitalism. So it's not just about a struggle between opposing significations within the contested terrain of said signifiers. It's a complex and uneven relationship between attempts from the subaltern to gain autonomy and the cost of disaggregating effects of the political and ideologic, ideological practices of the dominant groups, with successful hegemony from the part of the dominant groups depending upon a certain combination between recognizing and undermining the aspirations of the subaltern classes. So it is, and it's exactly the state as material configuration uh, dispositive and constant functioning of the hegemonic apparatus that defines the terms of this tendential unity of the dominant classes. And in a similar yet not symmetrical manner, the subaltern classes have to become state, this is a phrase from, from Gramsci, have to develop their own proper hegemonic apparatus in the struggle for autonomy in the form of political organizations that can offer the potential for uh, integral, uh, integral autonomy. So, uh, and I think that if we think of exactly this tension constantly going through uh, modern political forms, so uh, we can understand how the, the element of class domination and class exploitation is always present in the very notion of the people. Uh, it is also, 
exactly, exactly because the, the, the condition of postmodernity emerges at the intersection of, let's say, class-determined exploitation and the political forms that try to cope uh, with all these very basic antagonisms within society. So it is in this sense that terms like democracy, freedom, justice, liberty can become contested terrains. It's not that they offer a, a signifying function. It has to do with very real, practical, uh, contested uh, forms of political organization that, uh, that emerge. So and I think that uh, in this sense, uh, we can rethink, we can both rethink why, why very large uh, movements, contemporary movements, uh, can go back to the uh, vocabulary, imaginary, and discourse of the people as a common denominator of all this, uh, but also not lose uh, the basic uh, connection between the notion of the people and uh, class, class practices. Uh, and moreover, this helps us understand what it means politically to have a project to create a people. I would say this phrase. So, I mean, it, I mean w what it means. Because one of the problems of most contemporary forms of discussions of left populism is that it basically thinks that, well, the people are there, their problems are there, their grievances are there, and what we need is a successful communication strategy. It's to have a discourse that can unite them. And we cannot use old class reductionist discourse because people don't recognize themselves in classical forms as working class. Why? Because you don't have the same uh, images, it's more dispersed, uh, they, they might think of themselves as citizens, consumers, anything else. So, okay, let's find something that can unite them. But this is, in my opinion, something very, very different, uh, both from the actual workings of hegemony, but also for any possibility to have a politics that can create. I mean, it's like missing uh, the crucial link between the subaltern and politics that is, in a certain way, not the basis of any historical materialist approaches to, uh, to politics. Uh, I mean, in this sense, I mean that it goes back to something that has been a critique of Laclau on that, to like politics being external to the people. That the, po the point of enunciation, where it's like you're external to the people, and you just, this, but this is a statist conception of politics. The state is external in a certain way to the, to the people. Bourgeois politics can, can assume this position that you are external, you address them, and you try to get them together by offering a discourse that, I, 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 that can help them. I don't think that this can work in the same way if you want to have a politics uh, of the a politics of the subaltern, of the oppressed classes, of the exploited. What you choose, whatever way you want to uh, you want to uh, to discuss it. Uh, so I I would suggest that if we try to rethink uh, the possibility of. Of, of a politics of the people, but in, let's say, insisting on the class, insisting on class determination, and of course an anti-capitalist in, in the last instance perspective. So I think that the starting point is to insist on the people being uh, a historical and political possibility, based not upon a discursive construction, but upon a common condition of subalternity defined not only by interpolation, by hegemonic discourse, but also by exploitation, dispossession, which also includes ecological destruction, oppression, racism, sexism, and by, and by the articulations of struggles and resistances associated with this, this uh, condition. And I would think that one way to see it, because if you want to have a... I mean, Emancipatory politics is about the subaltern gaining what Gramsci says, historical initiative. 
through historical initiative and gaining integral autonomy. I like this phrase, integral autonomy, because it's symmetrical to the phrase that Gramsci uses about the state, where he says that the state in its integral forms is the entire ensemble of uh, activities that the dominant classes use to gain hegemony. So it's a very open, very relational conception of the state, which includes both public and private institutions and hegemonic apparatus. So in a certain way, integral autonomy of the subaltern is exactly this very expansive, a very expansive social and political project that would bring together their aspirations. But it has to be based upon their condition. It's not based upon a discourse. It must be something emanating from their practices. And it's interesting to see what are the contemporary linkages, interrelationships between the different forms of, of subalternity? Because one, one of the basic tenets of we say no to class reductionism, even in the 1980s, was OK, there is exploitation. There is oppression. There is patriarchy. There is ecological destruction. There is uh, sexism. They, have not, they don't have a common denominator. So discourse, in a certain way, uh, or a, democratic, a radical democratic politics, as Laclos suggested in the 1980s, the way to bring them together. But it is as if it is the political intervention, the political intervention from the top, from above, that creates the unity. I still believe, I'm a very classical Marxist in this sense, uh, kind of first international, the working class uh, emancipation must be a work of its of, 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 its, of its own, that you should think how the subaltern themselves, through their interlink, through the linkages, through the connections, can create these forms of unity. Of course, with respect to the relative, auton relative autonomy of the various uh, forms of exploitation and, and oppression. And for example, take, uh, I would suggest some points on that. First, the contemporary dynamics of capitalist accumulation uh, link subalternity to very specific dynamics of intensified exploitation that create common conditions upon a very vast spectrum of different employment positions, which helps the, uh, the articulation of common, of common demands. Although, because it's interesting, on the one hand, you have all this effort by the, by the capital to frag, for fragmentation of working class identities, roles, the, both in terms of uh, dispersal of, of uh, both geographical and social in a certain way, but at the same time, precariousness, uh, over-exploitation, the basic contradiction that contemporary workforce is the most educated workforce in the entire history of, of mankind, at the same time much more exploited, but also with communicational capacities to understand this, uh, this fact. So th th this creates elements. So for example, th there, there you can find a, a chain of equivalence, not semantic, real, practical equivalence, from the young degree holder aspiring to a career, having to work in very precarious situations, doing, constantly doing overpaid uh, overtime, getting very, very few for what he is. And he knows how much he is producing. He's, he's, he's educated. You can link that even to the undocumented migrant who is also in a, of course, much worse situation in terms, but also the same precarity, but also also able to communicate. If you study, for example, resist, uh, if you study the, the practices of refugees arriving, the ingenuity of the practices, how they try to organize, self-organize and try to get here, you can find common, common elements. So you can see that how uh, the contemporary condition of work creates common, common elements in a much more uh, impressive uh, way. Secondly, you have the kind of, let's say, authoritarianism meets exploitation situation all over the capitalist world in the sense of constant state interventions towards privatization, changes in work, uh, in uh, labor law, pension reforms, etc. So you have also this element that is common. Worse, uh, work is becoming worse in most advanced capitalist societies. Working conditions are becoming worse because of state interventions, very authoritarian and, and also undemocratic, which is also a very interesting element, for example, which also is, is very interesting that 
the democratic interpolation, which supposedly is a, a classical tenet of populist theories, we want democracy, in most cases it is evoked in relationship to, uh, to changes that affect how people work and live. I mean, for example, the austerity measures in, Greek, in Greece, it was about austerity. So it was a, a, a very big democratic demand. You cannot impose such a change in our lives. The change in their lives was uh, exactly uh, very material, very having to do with work. You saw it also in Spain. You see it in a certain way in France, where people speak about, well, they, they started with a fuel tax, but it's also about the minimum wage and things very, very real. So the demands for democracy and the demands very classical not even 19th century demands for social justice are very much interlinked. So this is another, another point. And you can also move that even, for example, you can also see, and there is work being done, both militant activists, but also theoretical, you can also see the linkages, how uh, you can also have a very plausible case that how capitalism also uses both, uh, can, uh, not uses, creates conditions for the reproduction of sexism and racism and, and colonialism. These are as very important aspects of, of the current regime of accumulation. So the colonial struggles, anti-racist struggles, anti-sexist, anti-patriarchal struggles are also have a material link to, let's say, anti-capitalist uh, struggles, which also creates forms and linkages which are, which are not just signification processes. And of course, if we look at the environment and the very fact that, well, capitalism basically is going to destroy the planet or actually overheat it so, to a way that it's going to be even uninhabitable, you can also there find. So I think that in, in, in this sense, you can have encounters between different movements without, with maintaining Common, both a common political discourse, but also common political, uh, common strategic anti-capitalist orientation. And I think this, this is a, a different way to think how you can use the notion of the people as opposed to, uh, to the people as a floating signifier that basically uh, connects. And I would also, of course, this also requires, especially in the European context, uh, a denational concept to denationalize de the uh, the people. Uh, if we're going to rethink what Gramsci called the national popular element today, the emphasis must be on the popular and not on, on the national. Exactly because uh, contemporary societies, uh, capitalist societies, the the, the, the subaltern don't serve the same national origin. So in a certain way, you have, so it's about a people, I would say it's not the nation that was, that creates the common identity, is the people to come. So it's not the imaginary community of common ancestry, it is the, the, the contemporary condition and, and of struggle, exploitation and oppression and the potential common future. And so you, and I think this is also, even though if you can, in certain instances, you can even uh, play a little bit with words and suggest, for example, that the, the migrant that serves the same, lives in the same neighborhood, uses the same public transport system, uh, is equally angry with taxation, and is also exploited as, in the same way, uh, is more national than, <laughs> The bourgeoisie, which in many cases, for example, prefers to uh, have an offshore base, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I do think that it's 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 very important to denationalize, speak about the people, not about the nation. Of course, uh, there is also a semantic problem in in Greek. It's all and in as in English, as in French, you can always make a distinction between nation and people. Something that you cannot do in German. And well, I don't know about Narod how he can. What are the connotations of, of people in the Slav tradition? But this is a thing to discuss. But anyway, I think the point uh, is that uh, nationalism, 
exactly because of its relations with racism and racism as being a strategic aspect of the capitalist offensive is something that uh, we always have to take into account. Now, I I'd also suggest before I finish that this, if we try to rethink the people as the result of all these linkages between different forms of exploitation and oppression in a very material way, this also en enables us to, uh, to rethink emancipatory politics, not just as interpolation. For me, uh, this is one of the most uh, important uh, problems with many varieties of uh, left populism. In the, it, 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 it is about politics from above. It's about having a successful electoral machine, having a successful political movement, having a successful left-wing government. But if you, if you think in these terms, uh, Apart from the problem that, the <coughs> practical problem that simply gaining governmental power doesn't mean much, and Greece is an example <laughs> in that. It can easily be a, a case of defeat, and then, and, or, or even of things going to the other way. You miss an important aspect. Any process of social transformation, uh, real social transformation, uh, cannot be just a, a question of political program. It has to be a process of collective experimentation. You need the collective ingenuity expressed in struggles and collective practices of the subaltern in order to actually change uh, things in a certain way, have new social relationships emerge. <laughs> and if I, if I would say also in very more practical terms, take for example the open question of uh, is possible uh, a left government in the European Union context? Okay, electorally it is possible. Greece is a case, an example, uh, even the rise, even the, the, the percentages gained by Podemos also was, uh, can say that they point to the possibility of having the left arriving in power through electoral means. We can also think about other countries, okay. You can also think about some, uh, for example, necessary first steps towards, you know, uh, fighting austerity. Uh, even I would go, not necessarily something like Syriza did, which was to capitulate. Let's say that you go with rapture. You exit the Eurozone or the European Union, uh, some, ext some first radical measures, nationalizations, etc. If you want to actually survive, in such a context, uh, which is a very competitive, antagonistic, uh, globalized, uh, aggressive capitalist environment, you need from day one uh, very rad to start to have very radical changes, not only in macroeconomics, but also uh, in uh, the very productive fabric. I mean, things like self-management, new forms of public ownership, democratic public, drastic changes in consumption patterns, because you cannot import <laughs> as you used to, or energy consumption and things like that, are necessary from day one. Okay, Syriza said that this would have been a disaster and opted for neoliberalism. If, we didn't, if you choose something else, you need very radical kind of socialist, in a certain way, experimentation from day one, from the period of first measures. You cannot accomplish such a process without a movement that is really based in the subaltern classes, not just represented, not having the subaltern classes having an electoral representation or following. You need them active. So you need a different form of politics than simply appealing to them. So it's also very, very practical, in my opinion, to rethink the people as a as class alliance, as, as this entire constituent process through which actual material interlinkages of struggles and resistances and forms of subalternity also turn into a political, political project. Of course, this is not easy because it requires, in a certain way, also new political, uh, new political forms. But for me, it's the only, the only challenge. For example, if you think 
which is basically this is what I suggested, as a constant process of dual power, which I think is the only way today to think of a potential kind of uh, breakthrough in advanced capitalist societies such as European. I don't mean the classical, I mean, I'm an old-fashioned Marxist, so I would love an armed insurrection of, of the people and, you know, something like that, but I'm not sure it's so easy. So if you think that you have a political breakthrough but with a strong movement, unless you think it as a kind of a permanent dual power situation where the movement always demands more, is more aggressive, expands beyond what the government is offering, but also creates a counterbalance to the constant counterattack for capital, then you would fail. So if you need something like that, first of all, you need a different conception of the people, which is not just a conception, it's a different practice of politics within the people, within the subaltern, trying not just to represent them, but also to, not even just to organize them, but also in a certain way to help them gain their own historical initiative, to use this phrase from Gramsci. But you also need very different political and organizational cultures in the left, because this, is a, this can only be described not as an electoral politics. This is a constituent process. You need new forms of organizing. You need to find gaining roots. You need uh, political forms that are kind of ex experimental sites that can really help people express, discuss their experiences, expand their experiences, things that usually you don't find in most left-wing uh, parties, and uh, you surely don't find them in the current choice, which is either the small sect or the broad uh, electoral uh, alliance with all the problems of electoralism and etc. So, but I, I do think that it's, it, especially, it's very urgent that we go back into this discussion. Uh, left populism offers a challenge a challenge to think, but I think we have to go beyond. And I think this, and if we see at, if we take into consideration that we have all the elements of a very deep and profound hegemonic crisis in all advanced, uh, I think in most advanced capitalist formations, I think France is an example because it's an example of a classical elements of a hegemonic crisis, a political elite, and not just aggressive authoritarian, unable to understand, unable to think in terms of, because uh, this, creates, this creates an urgent need to rethink exactly this reproduction, recreation of a people uh, in struggle as collective, uh, collective force uh, of, of the subaltern. So, well, so basically these were my thoughts and Thank you for listening, and I'm sorry I took up some of your time. Thank you, Martin Otis. Uh, very much ground um, covered, but also many questions open, I believe. Um, so we now have uh, time for a, for a Q and A session. Uh, but for those who are not aware of the format of, of our seminar, uh, we'll have at the end of, of, of today, we'll have a general discussion session of, of lasting up to two hours, depending on our uh, motivation and willingness, uh, where, uh, where uh, issues can also be deepened and uh, um, further, uh, discussed further on. Uh, and also then, of course, relating to both lectures we will hear, and then we will see whether we get some uh, maybe pro productive overlaps or maybe um, theoretical um, oppositions in that regard. But so for now, um, the, the idea is not, you don't have, we don't have to stick to the script, but the, the idea is that questions and answers and comments now, uh, uh, questions and comments now should maybe be more directed to the immediate uh, content of, of, the, uh, of the lecture itself, and the more broader discussions uh, which this will, in, will would inevitably inevitably lead to that we then uh, use the the later slot uh, of the general discussion session. So having said that, um, who has um, who has the first question or comment? Okay. Uh, yes, I'm Vladko Harapin. Oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> My name is Vladko Harapin. And my question is, what is the substantial difference between uh, 
left and right populism. Okay, yes, well, well, this is a, this is an interesting point. Uh, well, we, we can always, we can always find certain elements that we can say a typology uh, of populist uh, political practices. This is an open debate in uh, political theory, if you look in the, cert in the, in the, in the relevant uh, uh, literature, uh, which is the which are the elements that we can call easily as uh, as populist. Uh, of course, the classical distinction is that a left wing populism is democratic, calls for a kind of uh, expansion of democracy, social rights, social justice. Various, usually right wing populisms are uh, exclusionary. Uh, authoritarian, paternalistic in their approach and their and their demands. They're, they speak in the name of the of the common people, but also, in the end, call for a kind of authoritarian, authoritarian uh, rule. Uh, in my reading, in my reading, uh, I would suggest that usually, I would suggest that exactly because I don't think that a left wing populism is is possible. Uh, I think that usually populism can only end up as either a kind of right wing or establishment kind of, of populism. Uh, I mean, I, I mean that the kinds of elements articulated with populism, even in a, even in a theorization like Laclau, Laclau is a very peculiar, if you see the, the entire theoretical debate on populism in political theory, Laclau is, a, is one specific case. Uh, but if, if you take La clusterization, all these elements, the emphasis of a signifying kind of metonymic articulation of, uh, of creating common denominators, the emphasis on the uh, appeal of a discourse from above towards uh, society, uh, the centrality of the state, all this, in my opinion, mark a limit with left politics as a politics of the self-emancipation of the subaltern, or a politics of the subaltern uh, gaining uh, emancipation. In a certain way, populism, can, one can say, this is, this is interesting. When Laclau des describes the hegemony, bourgeois hegemony, then populism becomes more, more pertinent. In a certain way, I'm saying this, that's stretching it a bit, if you look at the original moment of bourgeois hegemony, the French Revolution, the, 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 the bourgeoisie representing its own particular interest as global interest and creating a kind of unity of the, of the people, uh, this, this indeed has to do with semantic shifts. You can also see it in nationalism. Nationalism is a semantic shift, is a discourse based common, above also a discourse based common identity. So you can see it in the bourgeois practice of politics, you can see elements of, of populism in successful, uh, in successful instances of uh, hegemony. So you can, of course, you can see progressive and or reactionary forms, but these are not left wing, if we associate left wing with you no know, radical social transformation. So this is this would be my answer to you. I don't know if I answered you, but I think this would be an answer. Sure, you don't. Okay, and that's it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So um, very much for following upon what you just said. I also have a few, um, I think I have a few arguments for why in principle it's difficult to talk about left populism. So one is that, um, you know, along the lines of, as you've described, in a populist um, f formulation of antagonism, the people is against um, some kind of signifier which is other. Um, and in the right wing version, as you just asked, um, the other is, as we know, you know, immigrants, Jews, you know, ethnic minorities, sexual minorities, or so on. The implication of which is um, that we need to eliminate them. 
So I think the formulation of that kind of antagonism leads to a violent, non-democratic outcome in, in principle, which is why it makes it very difficult to, to be compatible with the left politics. And also it promises something that's a lie, which is a post-conflictual future, like a post-political future. So if, as if we will resolve this, you know, if we remove this element, <coughs> which creates, um, uh, upon which the struggle is uh, founded, uh, then we'll have you know, a unity, a consensus, a resolution uh, of some sort. And I think that's, again, a very you know, problematic from a democratic pluralist uh, perspective, which makes it, for me, incompatible with uh, with a, um, a conception of a left politics. And then a third one, which I think you also, you said quite a lot about, is that in a populist um, formulation, uh, there's always a leader. So always someone speaking on behalf of. And um, uh, as you were saying, you know, this kind of focus on a successful communication strategy uh, and someone who will be representing and speaking um, um, for someone else. That again is uh, for me not compatible with a left emancipatory strategy where I see um, electoral politics as a tool for mobilization but not an objective, right? Where um, kind of the, um, um, in the context in which um, we have a very strong right-wing hegemony, uh, the main uh, task of, um, of the left is organizing and kind of rebuilding kind of social fabrics for what in your language is um, you know, enabling historical initiative and autonomy and, and in Gramscian terms. That's how I see it. Yep. That's just a comment. I don't think there was a question there. Oh, Sorry. <laughs> We should uh, get over the idea of, the, of a strict distribution of roles, uh, where, where the audience supposedly is only allowed to ask questions without uh, proposing uh, thoughts of their own. That uh, in itself, I believe, is also not really democratic. <laughs> um, maybe I wanted to, maybe I can now change this a bit, uh, the direction of this. And this will, will also probably be more, more comments than, than questions. But um, maybe also going back to Lacan and the relationship to Gramsci. And one way of conceiving of uh, Lacan's entire project would basically be, um, at least as far as I can see, an attempt of re reading Gramsci but through the lens of post structuralist anti foundationalism, like you, said, you have emphasized. That, like the, the problem of hegemony uh, is also central in the in the uh, in the book with um, with uh, Chantal Wolf, like hegemony and socialist strategy. Um, and of course, the the concept of hegemony itself in Gramsci was also one could say the theoretical consequence of facing a certain theoretical and political weakness of the left, theoretically insofar as it was uh, certain notions of. Um, Second international, uh, Marxism, not nationalism, uh, second international Marxism, the idea that precisely structural class positions, uh, once you have identified that, once you know that the proletariat in its structural sense is a growing part of the population, that the, uh, more or less the question of political, it's of, of its political uh, um, subjectivation as a revolutionary subject is uh, uh, something that is assumed as given. And of course, Gramsci faced the problem that, well, uh, contra to everything that w w was assumed uh, in second uh, uh, international Marxism, this was not the case, at least in Western Europe. And the question is why then are these societies stable where they should, according to Marxism, should be precisely uh, leading to, uh, to revolution? And, uh, and that was then the, the problem of, well, uh, and then the notion of hegemony or the people was an attempt to think beyond, uh, to, to respond to the problem of well, that uh, class in itself, the existence of structural class position in itself, does not necessarily lead to uh, the, the class as an emphatic political subject. Uh, that, that, there are, that this is more complicated as well. Also, of course, that the notion of the subaltern includes more than, the, uh, than only the working class, because not only the working class is subaltern, it's also the middle classes. They are also in a position of, well, uh, if we use that, uh, they also are uh, oppressed and, uh, and they face the, con if not immediately exploited, but they also have to face the consequences of a society profoundly restructured according to the logic and needs of capital. They fa face it uh, 
in terms of market pressure and, and, and everything that, that goes uh, uh, with this. So then, um, if that was the problem, and I believe still is the problem, and you have said the subaltern, we have to conceive of them as the, uh, as, uh, the other people, uh, and the subaltern is something that con is constituted through a common condition of subalternity, the people as a common condition of subalternity. But the, uh, one way to uh, maybe uh, respond to this would say, well, yes, but the common condition of subalternity, as we have seen uh, through all of the, the history of the left and to these attempts to uh, theorize them, does not necessarily lead to uh, a common experience of communality, let alone community. And this is precisely the crux of the problem. Uh, and Laclau tried to uh, respond to it in his particular way by more or less abandoning Marxism entirely. Um, and the notion of and, um, questioning the, the privileged position of class in, in, uh, in uh, left social uh, theory. Uh, but his was uh, an attempt, an attempt uh, to respond to this, uh, this problem. And so is, I guess, left populism. Um, but um, the question were now, well, maybe the question would be, why, why, what, what, what is it that makes it so difficult to translate a common condition of subalternity, even a common condition of exploitation, into a sense of uh, experience of, of communality and then political community, not in this reactionary sense, but in terms of, of a commonness of goals, a commonness of... Uh, and you say, okay, this has to be, to, uh, to be constructed through practices, um, but if the c c common condition of uh, subalternity is common, it has to manifest itself in lived experience, but this experience is not experienced as common. So I don't know if this is... Um, Oh, this is, well, this is, <coughs> oh, this is a, well, this is a very difficult question because this is basically the very question of politics. This is, I mean, what, what, what you describe is exactly the terrain of, of, of any potential antagonistic politics. Anyway, I would say that, uh, first of all, I, I insisted on this going back into Gramsci, because I think that in Gramsci we find a, a very a thinker that at the same time maintained a, a very classical conception of class determination, that he never abandons class, and at the same time th uh, thought through uh, in a very thorough way the, the complexity of politics in modernity all this, 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 this strange dialectic of recognition and disaggregation of the subaltern classes, and had the experience both of the evolution of the Italian political system, what he, and basically the notion of passive revolution, how uh, bourgeois hegemony never, not necessarily takes the form of an encompassing kind of uh, positive uh, hegemonic project, but also a more passive process, mainly aiming at uh, making sure that the subaltern not gain initiative. He also had the experience of a very reactionary authoritarian, yet in a certain way, one might say, popular movement, such as fascism. So he had the experience of a movement that had at the same time all these authoritarian, reactionary, uh, fascist elements, and at the same time it was a kind of, of a movement coming out of the traditions of, of modernity. So he had a much more dialectical approach to the questions we are, uh, we are, uh, uh, we are discussing, and I think that the notion of hegemony in the complexity that, we can, it, 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 that, it, that it comprises in the work of Gramsci, which at the same time as uh, direction, uh, concession, leadership, uh, through also including material aspects, not just ideological, is more helpful to rethink politics. Politics is indeed about hegemony. Politics is indeed about creating, in a set, which also means also creating some kind of community, because this is this is a a constitutive element of the politics of modernity. The politics of modernity capitalist modernity come after this immersion of the, of the, of the subaltern into the political scene. This, this is, it's impossible to, they cannot have a politics that leaves them 
out, as you can see, forms of radical exclusion in pre-capitalist modes of uh, modes of modes of politics. So hegemony is always about creating this kind of community and politics. You can on, only recently, and one might say this is also an element of a hegemonic crisis with neoliberalism and, and the current ultra aggressive form of neoliberalism. You, you have this element of people, of parts of, the, of, of parts of the population that are considered as surplus populations. That we don't care about them being, not even in the most passive way, included in an hegemonic uh, project, which I, for me is also a kind of a deeper crisis of, of the very ability of the bourgeoisie to retain its uh, its hegemony but, and also its. Okay, basic barbarism also in a certain way. So politics. This is so. So we're discussing about this. This is the relative autonomy of, of politics. What I'm saying is that it's not about. Oh, it's not about. Uh, uh, for the bourgeoisie, it's the state, and it is the integral state. Even the bourgeoisie doesn't base on a discursive kind of creation. This is a very material process by means it creates all the administrative, all, all, all the economic, all, and also all the ideological aspects of the state functioning in its complexity to have this kind of situation where people might have a common situation but not a common identity, not a common feeling and perception. So if you see how complex this is the process, you need a counter process a process that has to achieve, in a certain way, a similar element of, uh, of, of complexity. It's not an easy thing to create common identities, I mean, uh, through or common conceptions. But at the same time, there are moments where this comes forward. This is the moment of the of, of political crisis, the moment of when uh, we have very big movements, where suddenly you have this kind of people recognizing themselves in, in movements or wanting to be part of it as if. But this, what I'm trying to say is that this is not simply a signification process. Even surely it has a semantic, uh, a discursive kind of aspect, a, a question of things acquiring new meanings. This is, this is politics is also, is, pol politics is a thought and spoken process. So it's a process where you think and you speak and you address and you write. So, Yes, it is about that, but it's not only about about that. And also, and also, if you if you if you want to work towards this possibility, or to play with words, I would say this impossibility. That is, you don't have a it's not a mechanical causality. You can do the best political work, and nothing, and you don't see nothing happen, and then it happens. Suddenly, this, this, this is the result of overdetermination of the complexity of political attack. You cannot predict. But you still have to work toward this, this possibility. This is exactly what we're talking about left wing politics. And I think that the crucial notion here for Gramsci, if you go back, is the modern prince. It's very interesting how, it, which is a very, I mean, not just the, the political party, the very political process of the United Front or, or, or the political form of the subaltern, because it says the subaltern have to become state, but they don't have to become state in a symmetrical way. There's no symmetry between the modern priest and, and the state, but it's, it's not by chance that Gramsci uses this analogy. The modern priest would have been a new form of state. for So the modern priest for the subaltern is the political party, but not the political party as an organizational or electoral tool, but a much more complex, one might say, political, experimental, educational, cultural uh, process based in, on, on the actual condition of people. And you have, to, I mean, and, and this, and of course this would, but this requires uh, the ability to think in these terms and to organize in these terms and create this kind of more inclusive, expansive, and at the same time radical political uh, political forms, uh, which of course requires some form of, of uh, experimentation. How, which form can help create this thing? But we, you, you, you surely knew, we surely na know now. If you want to avoid cases like things, like, uh, cases like Syriza or the, what 
you need a deeper grounding in the popular strata, uh, a deeper, much more work, political, theoretical, educational, but also getting feedback, getting ideas from them, getting, getting inspiration for them, if you want, if you can have a sustainable, sustainable political project to that, uh, to that direction. And then, yes, you can create a people in a certain way, not or you can see a people being created a, as, a, uh, as a process, in a, which of course is not predetermined, it's, it's contingent, it is open, and it's always at risk of going to the, of going to the, uh, to the opposite uh, direction. So this would be the answer to your, to your question. Uh, so you can learn even from Laclau, you can learn from, but you cannot limit because as, as far as I have seen, attempts towards left, the problem is not whether you use the vocabulary of the people. I, I'm all in favor of using new vocabularies. I, I, I like the, I like, I think that it's important to find new ways to come, but it's not only about that. You have to know what you are doing and not think that simply addressing the people is, is the answer. I think our, the, our time is up for now, but this does not mean that our discussion uh, uh, ends here. So, so just to remind all of you, um, we now have a, 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 a break and we continue at um, th uh, 3.30 with Daniela's lecture, uh, the left in the European periphery from crisis to renewal, and then the fifth, uh, immediately after that session at 5.15, the general dis uh, discussion session starts. So uh, have in mind that everything that uh, we have discussed uh, here now uh, uh, sh can, should, and probably will pre-emerge also in the general discussion se uh, se session. Um, and I hope to see all of you uh, there again. Right. Thank you for your, for your time and patience. Yeah,